Rape culture gets discussed, it would seem, quite a lot online, either criticising and critiquing the idea of rape culture or making the claim that our societies are rape cultured or railing against and criticising and critiquing those arguments such as they are made. This is going to be my contribution to that. It's going to be spanning two videos, but this first video is going to be somewhat self-contained and will take you all the way to the conclusion, the conclusion which is going to be a resounding no. But in a kind of hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy sense, knowing the answer is 42 is only part of the issue. The real question is, what is the question? So that's something that I'm going to discuss right from the beginning now, because I think that that is a subject which leads to a lot of miscommunication and a lot of sometimes deliberate misdirection. It's not the answer, it's that people are addressing different questions. So let me make it quite clear that in this video I will not be disputing that there is something we can discuss called rape culture. I will not be disputing that such a thing as rape culture can exist within our societies and perhaps does exist within our societies. The question that I'm going to be critiquing is this suggestion that our society is a rape culture, that our society is rape cultured. And you hear this in phrases and you might want to Google some of these phrases such as we live in a rape culture or due to our rape culture or America is a rape culture. So that is what I'm going to be uh, trying to delve into and investigate. Are societies such as the United States of America and the United Kingdom reasonably defined as rape cultures? I think perhaps the thing I should do to kick us off before I get any further is to give us the definition that I wish to work to with regards to this. This is the definition I'm going to be using. In feminist theory, rape culture is a setting in which rape is pervasive and normalised due to societal attitudes about gender and sexuality. Now this is the definition that Wikipedia has run with and what it would be interesting to do, I think quite important to do in actual fact, is to give you the linked definition, the sociological definition that is linked for normalised there, just so there's no misunderstanding right off the bat. Normalisation refers to social processes through which ideas and actions come to be seen as normal and become taken for granted or natural in everyday life. So please bear those definitions in mind as we go forwards. In the second video I will cover these behaviours commonly associated with rape culture that are linked on Wikipedia and have a few things to say about that because these are things that are often discussed in the name of rape culture and I'll be making the argument in fact that they are discussed in lieu of discussing rape culture itself and that these things are often at best only tenuously linked to rape culture. So I propose on the basis of that definition that we really need to consider two things. In terms of the wording of the definition, the pervasiveness and the normalisation. The pervasiveness to what extent are rapes occurring and the normalisation, what are the societal attitudes towards rape, towards rapists and towards rape victims. Now I would suggest that if we're going to label a society as rape cultured, what we're going to need is a society that either has an abnormally high prevalence of rape or has overly accepting attitudes towards rape and rapists. Now the reason that I say this is unless we set that as some kind of criteria then the word ceases to fulfill any function. If we apply the criteria of rape culture to all cultures then a rape culture becomes no more than a culture. And that isn't why we use words. In science we create terms to add to the way in which we are explaining something. If a term adds nothing to what we already have, then it's pretty much useless as a term. That isn't why we have words. Words do not have intrinsic meaning. We give words meaning, and we give words meaning to do work for us. And that is exactly what we would expect to happen here. It's the same way as if I was to tell you that I am a man. That tells you something about me. If I now tell you that I am a tall man, that ought to tell you more about me than if I just told you that I was a man. But if I now tell you that my definition of tall is such that every man is a tall man, well now in terms of informational content, the sentence I am a tall man is indistinguishable from the sentence I am a man. The inclusion of the term tall has added nothing to the definition. 
So the way in which we apply rape culture to societies, to cultures as a whole, needs to be in such a way I propose that it distinguishes between those that have an abnormally high prevalence of rape or abnormally permissive attitudes towards rape and those that don't. It cannot simply apply across the board. That would be an unsatisfactory and unscientific and really rather futile and useless way of applying that as a definition. So they've written this down as the definition that I'm going to work to with regard to rape culture, taking that Wikipedia definition and applying it to whole cultures. A society could be considered rape cultured if either contemporarily or historically, it features either an unusually high incidence of rape and sexual assaults, or an unusually permissive or apathetic attitude towards rape and rapists, and dismissive attitudes towards rape victims. If anybody thinks that the reasoning that I've used to arrive at that definition is faulty, that I'm overstepping the mark, or I'm missing something there, let me know in the comments or make a video and say so. Okay, so assuming you're happy with that application, that definition, that's an application of the Wikipedia definition to the specific example of societies there, and moving forward, what I want to consider is what I think is the four scenarios whereby somebody who is a proponent of the idea that our societies are rape cultured could find some fertile grounds upon which to make that claim. So the four grounds are the following, that in terms of the pervasiveness of rape, the incidence of rape, that the amount of rape that's happening in any particular society today is either at an historical high or is higher than it is in most other places around the world, most other cultures around the world. Or in terms of attitudes to rape, it's more permissive now than it was in the past, or it's more permissive than it is in other places around the world. So that gives us four different alternative things to look at there. So let's have a look at the first of those. Let's have a look at the pervasiveness, but put it in the historical context. How much rape is taking place today in countries like the United Kingdom and the United States? And do we have reasonable grounds to think it's greater than the amount of rape that was taking place 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago? To be sure, there is more rape taking place in total, but that's because there are so many more people in total. This is a point that Steven Pinker has made in some of his essays dealing with crime and the way that we perceive crime and his contention that crime is probably at an historical low now compared to any time in the historical past because it's the way that we kind of view things and also the way that media represents things. I recall years back there was a big outrage in the United Kingdom about dogs, about pit bulls, and about how terrible pit bulls were and how they were savaging people and how American pit bulls needed to be banned and indeed they were banned as a result of it. And I recall that every day in the national papers there was a story of a dog savaging everybody. It was almost as if dogs had just laid dormant for decades and then all of a sudden every single day a dog was savaging somebody. Of course no, no more dogs were savaging anybody than they were the previous year or ten years beforehand. It was just that this was something that the papers didn't report upon. And once the papers want to report upon it, in a country with 60 million people there is always going to be a story somewhere of a dog savaging someone. So we need to be able to differentiate between how much of these things we see out there and how much of these things are actually taking place on a statistical basis. And that is very, very important. So what is the statistical basis for the historical incidence of rape? Well, of course, there isn't really one because the kind of statistics that we have today just didn't exist then. Now, that makes it very difficult for me to make my defence but, if, but there has to be something that these people are going on to claim that our society is a rape culture in the first place. If I haven't got the statistics because those statistics don't exist, then they haven't got the statistics either. One thing that they could be going on is this kind of idea of the noble savage, that simpler societies, that tribal societies, that societies outside of Western culture, are somehow, they haven't been tainted by this kind of violence that Western culture brings, and that there's a nobility to them, and that they're generally less violent, and especially with regards to sexual violence. One of the people that was perhaps fundamental in this was the anthropologist Margaret Mead. She went to places like New Guinea and Samoa and studied these people. As a result of her study, she contended that these societies were very, very different, that they had much lower incidences 
uh, of violence and especially of sexual violence. So things like rape just didn't happen within these societies. She has since been criticised. People have gone back and studied those in more depth and found that a lot of what she did was flawed. Now, some of the people that have criticised her, such as Derek Freeman, who turned into her, after her death, into her kind of arch nemesis there, he, they have been criticised themselves, but not in a way that undermines everything that they said about her. In other words, we can't really trust everything that she said. As Stephen Pinker says in page 56 of The Blank Slate, to begin with, the stories of tribes out there somewhere who have never heard of violence turn out to be urban legends. Margaret Mead's descriptions of peace-loving New Guineans and sexually nonchalant Samoans were based on perfunctory research which turned out to be almost perversely wrong. As the anthropologist Derek Freeman later documented, Samoans may beat or kill their daughters if they are not virgins on their wedding night. A young man who cannot woo a virgin may rape one to extort her into eloping, and the family of a cuckolded husband may attack and kill the adulterer. I do not see any basis upon which to extrapolate tribal societies and societies untouched by Western society and compare them to the kind of statistical data we have on populations of tens of millions of Western societies and by doing so make the claim that the societies in which we live in are rape cultured on the basis of a high prevalence of rape. Perhaps we would be better looking a little bit more recent. What about the United Kingdom 500 years ago? What about a thousand years ago at the time of the Vikings and the Normans were coming over and having their raids and their conquests? Perhaps the claim is being made that the incidence of rape per head of the population then was significantly lower statistically than it is today. If that is the case, I could not find any basis for that claim being made. And certainly in terms of attitudes, you would expect the very opposite. But I'll be talking about the attitudes in a few minutes time. We're just trying to deal with the statistics. Where I could find a statistical case was in terms of the United States over a much shorter term. I'm going to show you the statistics for the United States. These are the Bureau of Justice statistics for rates per thousand head of the population between 1973 and 2003. Have a look at this graph. It's gone down from 2.5 per thousand in just 30 years to 0 0.5 per thousand. If any of those cultures, the 73 culture or the 2003 was a rape culture, it was the 73 culture, not the 2003 culture. That is a really, really dramatic drop that we have there, folks. And what you could say is, well, perhaps there's some confounding factors there. The confounding factors that I could think of, such as uh, people's reticence to report the crime or such as uh, the recategorization of the crime such as marital rape being regarded as rape those are things which should skew the graph the other way round not which would skew the graph in terms of the way in which we see so I can see no historical perspective whatsoever there to claim that the levels of rape in the United States such as they are seen at present are historically abnormal in terms of being high. What about the situation around the globe? Perhaps the levels of rape in countries like the United Kingdom and the United States, maybe they're not historically high, but in terms of the present situation around the globe, they're higher than they are in other countries. Uh, and again, I don't see a case. If we look at the table, Wikipedia gives us a table uh, for levels of rape around the world per 100,000 head of the population. What is clear from this table is that it's very difficult to extract any useful information from it. I think it's clear from what we know about South Africa and Botswana that a case could be made that there are special problems in those countries and perhaps on the grounds of incidents they could be regarded as rape cultured but look at Sweden there we know that the case with Sweden that the figures of Sweden is so high because of the way that they decide 
to, to, to use their statistics and the way in which they report multiple rapes by the same person are recorded in the same way as separate rapes from separate individuals are recorded. So what is the case is that the way in which the statistics are recorded has a big impact upon the way in which it shows on the statistics. In fact, if we look up there at India, another country which most of us would suspect has a bit of a problem at the moment with regard to incidents of rape, the statistics are ridiculously low, a fraction of the level that they are in Western societies. And clearly there is an issue there with regards to reporting. And I suggest to you that most of the way in which the statistics are recorded in contemporary societies are more of a function of the way in which those crimes are reported within the society than anything which gives you anything meaningful about the society itself. Certainly when you look at the levels for the United States and the United Kingdom within this chart, there doesn't seem to be anything particularly abnormal or eyebrow raising about the levels that are shown relative to other states and societies. So my conclusion is that based upon the levels of rape, the pervasiveness that rapes that take place, that there is no case to answer for. No case has been made that our societies are rape cultured. But what about in terms of attitude? One thing that is most apparent is that in terms of attitude, as the centuries have ticked by, the situation for women has improved greatly. If I take you back, for example, to the times of the Old Testament, to the Tanakh, to the Jewish scripture, and let's have a look at things like Levitican law, what we can see is that the lot of women is not really very good. That a crime against a woman was basically regarded as a property offence. A woman was the property of her husband or of her father if she wasn't married. And so a crime against her, including the crime of rape, was regarded along the lines of a property offence rather than a crime against the individual woman. Thankfully, that situation has improved. Christianity didn't go a whole way towards improving it. Perhaps it would have done if it wasn't, of course, for Paul of Tarsus. But due to all his, his, uh, his, his love of letter writing, Pauline Christianity became de facto Christian orthodoxy. And it didn't hold women in very high regard uh, in, in many aspects. And so that has been purposeful. Uh, perpetuated over the centuries but gradually the lot of women has improved if you go back to the 1300s 1400s in the United Kingdom you can see references to this idea with regards to rape that if a woman get falls pregnant as a result of sex it couldn't have been rape because somehow women have it within their power if somebody rapes them to will a pregnancy not to occur so if the woman did fall pregnant that was a good indicator that she hadn't been raped no matter what other evidence may be present there so that would give you grounds for concern that perhaps their attitudes towards rape, rape were just a little bit fucking shaky back then but of course marital rape spousal rape this is something that has been a big issue and that has took a, that has been much more recent when that was finally dealt with so if you want to talk about how many rapes were taking place uh, in early historical times you have to bear in mind that a lot of things that we would regard as rape today I'm married to my wife if she begs me not to have sex with her but I carry on regardless we would regard that as rape but you don't have to go back very far before it wasn't in fact it was only in 1991 that in the United Kingdom we finally removed the exclusion on marital rape. It was 1993 before the last of the states in the United States did exactly the same thing. They'd started the process sometime before then, but it was only in 1993 that all the states uh, took that line. So this is a very, very recent change, folks. But look at where it puts us today compared to where we were. So in terms of attitude, we've gone from viewing women as the property of men and from rape as effectively a property crime to a situation where we are much more aware of the fact that it is a crime against the individual and of the paramount importance of consent with regards to any sexual encounter. Consequently, in terms of our attitudes towards the crime of rape and towards rapists and rape victims, I think it would be a real stretch for anybody to say that in Western societies today that our attitudes are unusually permissive in terms of an historical context. In fact, it would seem as if the exact opposite is true, that probably we take those crimes more seriously today than we have at, at any time 
in recorded history. And I think it's almost trivial and hardly worth dwelling on to apply the same criteria to cultures around the world today. There are still countries out there such as Ethiopia and South Sudan that still have exclusions for marital rape. We've seen some of the provincial attitudes in parts of India towards not just rape but gang rape and how those that live in the bigger cities find absolutely abhorrent as we all do in the West whether we live in the big city or whether we live in the countryside alike it doesn't make any difference so let's leave that to one side I think but what about looking at the whole situation in the present day right what about considering in the present day the way that we view rape uh, as opposed to the way we, we view other offences against the person, including other offences of violence against the person, including murder and serious assaults. Well, these kind of statistics are really hard to come by in terms of how people feel about them. If you go and search this stuff out, as I've tried to do, what you will find is lots and lots of attitude surveys towards sentencing and towards the sentences that we would give to rapists, but very little towards the abhorrence we feel towards rape itself. It's almost as if that's taken as a given that we regard it as a crime as the utmost seriousness and as a crime of abhorrence rather than actually demonstrating those things. But I have found a few nuggets that I would like to share with you, which I hope demonstrate, which you probably already suspect anyway, because of your experience of living in the world. One of them is a study that took place in Hong Kong, that's about the best as I could do with regard to this, where they applied thirst and severity index of crime. Bear in mind Hong Kong is part of China, but it was leased into the United Kingdom up until only a decade or so ago, and so has a very strong Western influence and a British influence on it. And they applied thirst and severity index there, where you rate one crime against the other, and so you get these metrics. So let me show you the list of crimes here in the matrix. What I'm showing you here, crime one is rape, uh, crime three is murder, crime four is a serious assault, crime six is blackmail and intimidation. What you can see is that the only crime out of all those crimes down there that has been regarded by people as worse than rape, okay, was murder. That was the only crime that was regarded as worse than rape when people were asked to differentiate and to set aside one crime against the other and say which one is the worst. I also want to link you some information here which was from the Sentencing Council. This is from the British Sentencing Council. Attitudes to Sentencing Sexual Offences. And a couple of little bits to read out here with regard to rape. Existing research tended to provide evidence that suggested the public were punitive in their views towards sexual offenders, that they felt sentences given for convicted offenders were too lenient and that consequently there was a gap between the public and, for example, judges in terms of views on appropriate sentences. Now that in itself might not show that people regard rape as this particularly abhorrent crime, it's just that courts tend to be especially lenient. But some other parts in this say something very different. Comparison between rape and other offences, public perceptions. Members who the, of the public who took part in the focus groups were also act, asked to uh, the sentences they considered appropriate relative to two other offences discussed. Grievous bodily harm, that's a term we use in English law if you're not familiar with it. Common law decisions, courts have said that it, the way that you should regard grievous bodily harm as really serious bodily harm. That's the way they said it should be interpreted by a court if the wording seems a little bit unclear. And that's a high scale offence above actual bodily harm, basic common assault. Uh, Rape was perceived by the focus group participants to be a more serious offence than drug dealing or grievous bodily harm. However, specific aspects of the comparison offences did alter perceptions. For example, heroin addiction was perceived to, to destroy lives and therefore selling heroin was almost as serious as rape. So even being a heroin dealer, folks, 
was regarded as less serious than being a rapist. So we're still along the same kind of lines, which is that the only thing that is really worse than raping people's perceptions is murder, and perhaps not discussed there, but also some uh, fences against children. Those are the only things that are regarded as worse. They also talked about victim survivor perceptions and said that victim survivors also discussed and prompted comparison offences such as comparing sexual offences to that of stealing a car for car fraud or murder. The view is that offences against property should never be considered more serious and sentenced as such than offences against a person. A homicide was viewed as one of the only offences which could be considered more serious than sexual offences. However, and then it goes on to discuss the way in which, and I haven't got all of it in this little screen cap here, but that some of the people still regarded in many ways murder as lesser in some ways than rape. And in fact, if you look around the net, if you do a Google search for along something along the lines of rape worse than murder, what you will find is quite a lot of discussions out there about why are people about about people regarding rape as even worse than murder and quite a lot of quite sober discussions where people are asking the question why do some people regard rape as worse than murder and not saying that in the case of well this is just absolutely outlandish but regarding it as a serious question why is it are there some justifiable reasons in which we can regard rape as worse than murder in fact here is a debate or debate that has been up for quite some considerable time there 44 percent of online recipients do regard rape as worse than murder in this particular case and if you go and have a look at this page you'll see some of the arguments that they make so in terms of these things that I could find it seems that we regard rape as one of the crimes of the most utmost seriousness one of the crimes of the greatest abhorrence of any of the crimes that is, is within our ken to consider one of the things that is often claimed is that within our media, within television drama, within films, within video games, that we take a very loose and permissive approach to the crime of rape and sexual violence. So maybe that's something that we sh should consider as something of a case study here. Emily Buchwald, in an influential, if somewhat inflammatorily titled book, Transforming a Rape Culture, gave an alternative and highly misdirecting, in my view, definition of rape culture. Within that definition was the claim that such a society regards violence as sexy. Whilst taken at face value this may appear true, it is a spectacularly manipulative turn of phrase as far as I'm concerned. In all these media, whether it be television, drama, film or video games, the violence that we're expected to regard as sexy is of the resolutely non-sexual variety. Such is the case in the highly popular Game of Thrones, a game full of violence which also has its share of sexual violence, but this is explicitly used always to cast characters in the most negative of lights possible. Consider the situation where King Joffrey has that prostitute trussed up in his bedroom and to get his sexual kicks kills her by firing crossbow bolts into his body. We the viewer are not shown that to show King Joffrey as some heroic figure, to show him as some sexy figure. We are shown that because the people that are writing that know just how horrified we will be by that. Just what a negative light that will cast King Joffrey in. Just what a terrible monster it will show us that he's become. The sexy violence is not the sexual violence. In fact, here is Anita Sarkeesian ably making the same point. Plot devices that capitalize on female trauma for shock value function in much the same way as the hitting a child or kicking the dog tropes do. No one defies Thag the Impatient. Hey, are you happy now? It's casual cruelty, implemented as an easy way to deliver a quick emotional punch to the player, by presenting attacks on characters specifically designed to appear pitifully vulnerable. These scenes serve no real purpose in the plot other than to let the audience know that the perpetrators are truly deplorable monsters. Never speak of my mother like that again, you little whore! Oh! 
So in addition to helping paint a gritty picture for the rest of the game experience, this kind of sexualized violence against inessential female characters is exploited by developers as a sort of cheap one-note character development for the bad guys. It was just a god dang whore, man. A god dang filthy whore. It's a lazy shorthand for evil, meant to further motivate the protagonist to take the villain down and help justify the excessive violence committed by the player in these games. So I think that's something of a first with me using Anita Sarkeesian to highlight a point, but thank you for that Anita. The truth is that myriad video games exist where the sexy hero, either male or female, kills and disembowels a thousand unfortunate computer controlled non-player characters or NPCs. Show me the game where the sexy hero rapes and molests thousands of NPCs and maybe then I'll concede the point. As it stands in video games, I propose, it is exclusively non-sexual violence which has been normalised. Sexual violence is notable largely by its absence. Consider, if you will, the game Grand Theft Auto V, a game banned for its violence against sexualised women by the target chain of stores in Australia and regarded as evidence for rape culture. Yet for the, all the celebration of crime and violence that is Grand Theft Auto V, the thing that sets sexual violence apart from all other acts of crime and violence is that the game simply does not allow it. Sexual violence alone is treated with a reverence that places it off limits. Feel free to steal and blackmail with gay abandon, stove a man's head in with a baseball bat, blow an old woman's brains out of school with a shotgun, but rape and sexual assault, not in a million years. Yet of all this violence, what caused sufficient societal outrage to get the game removed from the shelves by Target Australia? Well, the fending content was that following wholly consensual sex with a prostitute, the game mechanics are such that you can then run over or shoot the prostitute in the same way as you could any other NPC within the game. So never mind sexual violence being treated as the holy of holies, even the possibility of the player committing an act of non-sexual violence too closely after an act of sexual union proved just too much to stomach. So how do you reckon Grand Theft Auto 6 would fare should they allow the player to rape and sexually assault as they presently allow the player to murder? Do I even need to provide you with an answer to that one? Given the huge disparity of treatment between sexual and non-sexual violence in video games, it is somewhat ironic that in an online article for the UK national newspaper The Independent, one of the 14 evidences we live in a rape culture was cited an unofficial games modification a player had created that did allow the Grand Theft Auto player to rape. So there we have it folks, a huge and complex game that treats sexual violence with kid gloves and we're expected to infer nothing. Consider Grand Theft Auto V and consider those two factors, prevalence and attitude. Consider how it handles murder and rape and now tell me which of those two is normalised. Is this game rape cultured or is it murder cultured? Is it actually evidence for rape culture or the exact opposite? Yet some random person in their bedroom creates an unofficial mod that at worst means that rape is placed on a par with murder and gratuitous violence and suddenly this game is now evidence that society is rape cultured. I'll be honest with you, I don't really know whether to laugh or cry. So in conclusion with regard to attitudes, I think, I hope that I've made a fair case that rape is regarded with more seriousness today than it has been in the past and when compared to the way that we view other crimes in the present, that it's viewed with an abhorrence greater than any other crime that you could, mit, could commit against an adult other than perhaps murder and yet even then the situation is not clear and certainly in terms of the way that it is handled within our media and especially within video games it appears to be handled with a, a reverence that far exceeds the way that we handle crimes of non-sexual violence. Okay, so that's my conclusion with regard to this. I think that it's time now for an overall conclusion and a couple of little hypotheses that I want to leave you with. Okay, so I think that it will not leave you exactly flabbergasted when I say that my overall conclusion is that we do not live in a rape culture, that Western societies are not rape cultured. Let's have a look at what we've done. 
we've had a look at those two factors of pervasiveness and of normalization of attitude, permissiveness of attitude towards rape, perhaps trivialization of the idea of the crime of rape. And we've looked at that in these two contexts, the historical context and also the contemporary context. And in terms of normalization of attitude, we went a little bit further and looked at the globalization comparing Western societies with other societies, but then had a look within Western societies comparing how we feel about rape compared to how we feel about other nasty crimes against the person, crimes of non-sexual violence, murder and such. I couldn't find a single segment where it makes sense to say that Western societies are rape cultured. In fact, perversely, the very opposite seemed to be true. Every time where I seem to find some evidence, it seemed to point to the exact opposite. That the point of time in which we live and the societies in which we live seem to treat rape with more reverence and with a greater abhorrence than any time in the past. And that our levels of rape, although these things weren't so easy to evidence, it would not surprise me if they are also at an historical all-time low. But I have a couple of points that I want to make, a couple of hypotheses that I want to make, which perhaps suggest what I think is going on here. The first is to suggest that I think that rape has been treated in such a special way and for so long that we've kind of gotten used to it and we've stopped taking note of it anymore. I can maybe liken that to you if that's not clear what I mean. If I do a favour for you, you will appreciate that I've done you a favour. If I do you that same favour two or three times a week, week on week on week, in the end you start to take that favour for granted and you start not to notice that favour and the only time that you will notice that favour is when that favour is withdrawn and then it looks as if that is the difference, that is the special thing, that I'm not doing that thing rather than the fact I was doing it as a favour to begin with. And I suggest that part of that is what is going on here. That we are so used to seeing crimes of rape and sexual violence being treated with kid gloves that even if we as much as just treat rape and sexual violence in the same dismissive cursory manner in media is, as we do murder and serious non sexual violent assault that that then becomes abhorrent within itself and that looks as if it's something that could indicate rape culture whereas in actual fact all we're doing is taking away those special privileges with which we innately seem to want to grant those particular crimes and I don't think we're aware of that. I think that is something that is within our subconscious. And so when people are pointing at these things, they're not necessarily doing it deliberately misleading, but they don't realise the special status that they themselves, along with everybody else, has been granting these crimes. The second thing is that we often point to rapes and the way that the public handles them as evidence of rape culture, as if we're not taking rapists seriously, as if we are in some ways refusing to accept when rapes take place, or providing mitigation against rapists, and in some ways that suggests that we don't regard rape as a very serious crime, that we don't regard rapists as people that need to be punished, or that we are dismissing rape victims. I want to suggest to you that the exact opposite is true. That whilst we do often do those things, and whilst when we do those things it is highly regrettable, we are not doing those things because we take rape, li rape lightly. In fact, if we took rape lightly, we would not feel the need to do these things. It is because we regard rape as such an abhorrent crime that we find it so difficult to accept that somebody is a rapist. Consider this. I would sooner admit that my best friend is a murderer to you than admit that my best friend is a rapist. So if somebody says to me, well, your best friend has committed a rape, he has been charged with a rape, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm not going to want to acknowledge that fact because it's such a crime of abhorrence. If I regarded it as a triviality, I would be much keener, I'd be much happier to accept it than because I regard it as such an act of seriousness. And if it then becomes, if the evidence then starts to look overwhelming, then the same as I would with any other really, really serious crime, if I have an investment in that person, then I'm going to start to look at some kind of mitigation. The same way as if we have a friend who's murdered their husband or wife, we want to try and find some kind of reason why they might have done it. Surely they've been provoked, surely they must have suffered, because this person we know would never do that kind of thing. 
And the reason that we do that kind of thing on a societal level, I propose, with regard to rape, is the same reason we have done with Jimmy Savile or a number of other people when they first came to light with regard to child sex offences in the UK. It's not because we trivialise those offences, it's because we regard them with such gravity that we're so loath to make that, to, to, to put that onto people unless we're absolutely sure that that is what they did. The, the, now I offer that to you as an hypothesis and I ask you to set that alongside the alternative hypothesis that the reason we do these things is because we regard it as a trivial crime right and I ask you which one of those hypotheses fits the data that shows how serious we regard rape I propose my hypothesis does I've shown you some information which shows you just how serious people regard rape the hypothesis that I give fits that data this idea that really secretly we're trivializing rape that we don't regard it as anything serious doesn't fit the data I'll leave you with those thoughts now and welcome you to join me back again for the second part where we'll look at some of these factors that have been associated with rape and why I find that such an unsatisfactory way of carrying on thank you for watching this video bye for now